Hello, and welcome to the Service-Based Business Society podcast. I'm your host, Tiffany Ann Botcher. On our weekly episodes, we will dig into everything you need to know about scaling your service-based business without losing sleep. With my experience in creating over seven figures per month and a passion for marketing, finance, and automation, this show will provide tangible tips and techniques for scaling your business. Let's get started. Hey guys, today we are talking with Adam Keller. Now, Adam owns a party rental company. He made a YouTube channel about the events industry. He has a TikTok page and another YouTube channel about side hustles and starting other businesses. He is a serial entrepreneur and has so much knowledge to share about business partnerships, YouTube content creation, and overall entrepreneurship. Super excited to have him on the show. So welcome, Adam. You've got so many different things going on, so I can't wait to hear more about them. Um, why, don't you, why don't you kind of take it a little bit from the top into how you made your shift into entrepreneurship and, and if that was something you knew you always wanted to do? Uh, not really. So when I was 18, I kind of thought I wanted to own a bar, but that never happened. And being in the businesses that I'm in dealing with bars, I realized, you know, when I was older, I was like, yeah, a bar is a whole, I just would have hated a bar. <laughs> just, you know, the, the, the long hours on the weekends, the drunk young people, I would have hated it. So that's what I thought I wanted. But so I went to college and I was, I was doing a business degree and I hated accounting and I hated business calc. It was too late for me to drop it. So I saw, I just didn't go to class. And then the final test, you know, it's just 10, 10 questions where you have to fill a whole page. And I just wrote jokes. Like I just learned a bunch of, bunch of math, math jokes. Like why was six afraid of seven? Because seven, eight, nine. What do the constipated mathematician do? He fingered it out with a pencil. <laughs> then on, on the back, on the last question, I just put, hey, listen, you know, I just dropped this. Or I got, I got done with the business degree. I just need to pass this class. Can you just please pass me? And she did. Um, but I, I was in a cab going to a defensive driving class and I was just talking to the guy who was like 45 minutes away from my college, telling him what I wanted to do. And he's like, do you really need to go to business school to own a business? And I was thinking like, I don't know. I, I, I'm hating accounting. I'm hating business calc. I'm hating every other business class. And it just hit me like, you don't really need to go to business school to open a business. Yeah. You just open a business. You go to business school to become a manager at a big company. Not to, not to own your own business. So for the four years of college, I, I didn't really think about it anymore. I went on to my other degrees. And then one of my roommates worked for a party rental company because that's what I mainly do, party rentals. And I'd occasionally go work with him at the one he was working with in the city we were in. And then in the summer, I came home and worked at one in my hometown. And that's when I started seeing the uh, invoices. Before, I just show up, do the things they tell me to do. But now I'm seeing invoices because I'm in the trucks. And I was like, wow, this is a lot of money. I could do this. So two weeks into leaving or graduating, uh, this is back before the internet, not really the internet, but before it was super big. So I called the penny saver paper. I called the local newspaper and I called the yellow pages and got a listing for the business I was going to create doing tents and try to get the stuff out. Fantastic. You know, it's interesting. Everyone has their different, you know, their different journey. And as someone who has been to school, lots of school, I love, I love school. I could go to school forever. But often I hear people say, I'm going to, I need to go back to school. And, and I, you know, it's like, if you actually just took the same amount of time um, and dedicated it to learning outside of school, you could, you could quite, t- you know, often make your business such a success and, and it, it really isn't required. I think you were so right when you said, you know, it's required to be a manager in a big, big company, but to start your own business, it sometimes it's just, you know, passion and intuition and jumping in and, and, you know, you can hire uh, for different pieces that you don't know, or, you know, YouTube books. It's, it's incredible the amount of uh, information and resources that are available. We really are in this information overload era where you can learn just about anything. Yeah, for people who don't um, ever think about it, there's Facebook groups for pretty much every single business category. So I'm in the tent world. There's, business, there's like 10 Facebook groups for my world. Bounce house groups, painters, bookkeepers. 
if you can think of a business, any business, there's at least one Facebook group for it. And the groups are there because people want to join them and learn. And all those people uh, don't treat you really as competition because it's nationwide, it's worldwide. Uh, they they just mm-hmm. give you all the info. And then also, you got to go to school. Like, that's going to be a lot of money. You could spend 0.001% of that on some reliable, like, business coach kind of guy, uh, course, whatever, Patreon, yeah. whatever, and uh, learn everything about a particular field for maybe 50 bucks a month subscription to some person who's in the field you want to be. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, Facebook groups are often um, underestimated, but people really do start to kind of build that connection and community um, and share so much knowledge. Um, It's incredible. I um, am a a member of a few different groups myself. And, uh, you know, it's it's interesting. Like you said, people don't necessarily view it as competition um, because it is so wide. And I, I truly believe that there's enough room for everyone to be successful. Everyone has their own yeah, specific is. niche and, and what makes them unique and so good at what they do. Um, and so it's actually through this podcast that I've connected with so many people that I probably wouldn't have um, without the podcast to be able to sit and chat and, and go through some different pieces. And it's been probably the most rewarding part um, to, to be able to collaborate and right. connect with other entrepreneurs. This episode is brought to you by Eleanor. Eleanor helps you create an automated business and provides a custom tailored solution to track conversions and metrics, deliver workflows, and provide you with all of the tools you need to succeed. Eleanor ensures you can go from an overwhelmed business owner to a confident CEO that has more time, less stress, and bigger profits. As a listener of the show, you can get 25% off with the discount code SOCIETY. Go to eleanor.io and use code SOCIETY. That's E-L-E-N-O-R-E dot I-O, discount code SOCIETY. So once you got started um, and you decided that you were you were going all in, how long ago was that? What year was that? Uh, I graduated college. Okay, so you've been at this a while now. And, and have you had any major shifts to your business then? Or, you know, have you been able to to kind of stay on the same path i noticed you know you've you've got lots of different businesses on the go so would you say that you've you've modified what you were doing or added to it added to so speak of facebook again you know when you got people who on their facebook page say that they own five businesses and then you really into i know a person like this um they own a little diner an ice cream place and a food truck thing but it's all in the same building it's all one business, um, but they like the, right. the clout. Uh, so that's like what I'm at, but I just tell people I'm in really one business. I have the party rental company. And then with party rentals, people want dishes, but I never wanted to do dishes. So I had an employee who was like really, really good. And so I gave him equity. He's going to run the dishes and glasses and flatware, wash them, take care of all that uh, for equity. Because if he owns it and his work produces money and he's going to keep everything really, really clean. So that's technically a separate entity, but it kind of works together. And then I have a restroom trailer business with two other guys and that's a separate business kind of, but it also works together. And then our our truest separate business is we own this 12,000 square foot barn converted into basically a mansion um, into an Airbnb that doesn't really have too much to do with the rental stuff. Uh, so that, so I own two businesses, but really four. Right. Okay. So this really comes into this, you know, niching down and, and this concept. And I, I don't necessarily agree with how specific a lot of marketers talk about going into niching down. But what I am hearing you say that I 100% agree with is when you're expanding, you're going into something that is a similar audience. You're expanding your offering to the same clientele or a slightly modified clientele. Right. It's, you know, the someone who already owns a clothing store and adds another line to it is, is you know, offering to that same audience. But it's it's when you make these pivots and additions where it's, you know, you own a clothing store and then, oh, and I opened the ice cream shop. And it's like totally different. And it, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's definitely um, more time consuming because you're learning something entirely different. And so when you're adding pieces on, um, you know, you're using the knowledge that you've accumulated instead of starting over again. 
And so you're, you know, you say, okay, well, I, I know enough about this audience and the, the equity piece. So tell me a little bit more about how that worked and what you liked about it. I, I often get the question of people who are trying to uh, maintain relationships with someone who's very important in their business. Maybe they've been around since the very beginning and they are now, you know, making that next step, but they want to make sure that that person feels appreciated. And so, you know, it's, should, should I give them a piece of the ownership, um, you know, and, and what that looks like. And so we, talking about equity versus ownership, how has that worked for you? Uh, it's, it's worked good. So uh, there were things that I didn't want to deal with. So with the dishes, it's literally like we got 20,000 dishes that got to be washed every single week. I yeah. don't want to deal with that. I don't want to hire people to, to and then be on their behinds to, to do that. So it was just like, hey, you do this, you get people to do it. Uh, and at first we were 50-50 because I put up all the money. He does all the work. I've only cleaned a few dishes at all. So I've done no work for it, but I put up all the money. And then eventually once we got to a point where it's like, all right, we've been making a lot of money. I'm dropping down to 30%, you own 70%. Uh, and that relationship was tough to navigate. That, that partner went through like a messy kind of like relationship ending. And during two years, he was a mess. And there was a lot of fights, but we worked through it. And now we're at a better point. The restroom trailer thing, was like, you know, I'm already out eight hours a day setting up these big weddings. I don't have time to do this. Plus they were my friends and I trusted them and I wanted to make their lives better too. So they did it. And also I just didn't want to deal with poop um, cause, cause it's a, it's a restroom. But come to find out that you never see it cause it's a luxury restroom. It gets hooked up to a pump and you never see it. But, uh, that one's been good, but yeah, when you're in it with friends or other people, there's relationships and things that happen in life and work ethics, and it, it's it's rough to navigate and money's involved, so it's, it's rough. so if you could take a le- you know if you could take one lesson that you learn from you know those two relationships. So just to give you you know a little history as well, I um, when I made the shift out of corporate, I had two business partners and and made the decision to leave. And that was probably one of the most difficult things to navigate um, in my career and going through the pieces. And and if I look back and I say, you know, what really led to the decision to leave, you know, it's, we got started when we were very young and um, over the decade, we kind of all, you know, we all grew a lot um, and the business had great success but we almost grew apart versus growing together and and really realized that a decade later, we all really wanted different things. And so that was the very tough to navigate um, after spending a, you know, a decade building a business with, with two people. So what did you, what did you take away or have you taken away from, you know, those partnerships and, and how would you offer advice to others who may be thinking about, you know, partnering with friends and, yeah. and equity stake and all of these different things? Don't get into a partnership with someone who's too young. So he was probably like 23, 24 at the time. That that was the big thing. Kind of like you said, you were young and you, through the years, grew grew differently. So that's basically what happened. And then life things happen. Uh, if you get into a partnership with someone who's a little more mature and established, you kind of already know how they'll be. 24-year-old, I mean, you don't know anything. So, so don't... A bunch of you 20 year old kids who are in college right now and it's like hey, we're gonna start a business together uh do it on your own you don't you actually don't need them like yeah it seems cool and camaraderie com- camaraderie but your, your business probably doesn't need them so i mean some businesses will some sort of segments will but uh you can you can pretty much do it alone and it'll be much better and, you, and relationships will be better yeah, I think when you touched on the work ethic piece, I think everyone has a different variation of what all in means. And, you know, the entrepreneurs are such passionate people. It's all, you know, the the will to keep going when it gets tough and put yourself out there and be rejected and get up and try again and all of these different pieces. Um, when you get that, when one person really is all in and someone else is not necessarily um, or it is their version of all in. Um, it is it it can really lead to some some additional challenges for sure. 
yeah, yeah, partnerships are rough. And if you can see any sort of path to do it yourself, just do it yourself. You can bring them in later um, or you can start another business with them later. But I think doing it yourself is better. Yeah. So now that your business is growing and you've, you're have you offering lots of different teaching and whatnot on YouTube, when when did that shift happen where you wanted to now share your knowledge with others? Was that was that early on? Have you decided, you know, did you decide that has that always been your way or is that more of a recent development? Yeah, so I would always like my competitors would come to pick up stuff because in the rental world we do this thing called sub rental. There's no reason for me to turn down a five thousand dollar job if I don't have 50 chairs or the vice versa. We'll get the chairs from the other company. So whenever they would come, I'd show them all my cool stuff because I'm the only one in my area who had the cool stuff, like to, to the jackhammers, the stuff to pull out, the, just the stuff for more efficiency and to make things faster or to keep things clean. And I would sh- try to show them all this and they didn't seem very interested and none of them have ever bought any of it. Um, Cause so I, I'm watching them from the outside and some of them are very big, but I know for a fact that I wait, I make way more money than they do because we keep things we get things done faster. Employees are not as tired or whatever. But anyway, so uh, I was trying to show them this and, you know, they're listening, but whatever. They didn't do any of it. And then I just used to watch this one guy on YouTube. Um, he talks about Magic the Gathering. Some people listening are going to know that. Uh, it's called Alpha Investments. And he literally just points his camera at his face and talks for, it used to be 10 minutes exactly so he could get the ads. Now it's eight minutes exactly so he can get the ads. Uh, I was was like, this isn't that bad because one of my degrees in college was video production and I just did not want to be doing editing and stuff because I'm already busy. So I was like, he's just pointing a camera at his face, you know, I'm just going to point at a point camera in my face because if you go to my channel, there's not high production. I try, I spend the least amount of time. I don't even put tags anymore. My first few hundred videos had tags and stuff. So that gets everyone in the channel. My next 400 videos. I just upload, no tags. Um, so it was just like seeing that other person and the simplicity of just point a camera at your face and go. If, if I had to do it on, if, if I couldn't do it on a phone and I had to use a regular camera and import it into a computer, I wouldn't do it. Interesting. You know, it's I, I feel like on YouTube, there's this some, you know, if you look at Mr. Beast, for, you know, everyone knows Mr. Beast, it's... Um, it's produced in a way that looks like it's not produced. You know what I'm saying? It's 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 done in such a way. But then you get the the videos where you know it is just that just just the camera, just recording, just you know the value, and and the success, the wild success, is incredible. And so you know, and and there is so much time that goes into editing and and whatnot. So very interesting for to hear you say you know you just upload straight from your phone and and you've yeah. I did well. This also has right. iMovie okay. too, which was a plus because because I don't like spending money on apps. <laughs> so I had iMovie, and it was pretty easy. Um, I've since I used to use Adobe Premiere Pro. Blah, blah. I used to use Adobe Premiere Pro in school, so I knew it, but yeah. I didn't want to buy it, and I could no longer pirate it because I got flagged one time. So, but I have since bought it, so I can edit the longer interviews because I tend to like do what I'm doing right now and take a pause. I just hate it and I just wanted it out. Um, But uh, I call myself a guy who does YouTube, not a YouTuber. Like I don't like YouTubers where they're all like crazy and zany and crazy editing and they change their voice and whatever. They're YouTubers. I'm just a dude who does YouTube. I like that. I like that. At the end of the day, it really is just about getting your message, your information out and to to the people that need to see it and hear it and you know if it if it can be done in a simplistic way and deliver the results i why not i mean it's why not yeah you may not grow gigantic i'm thinking i'm only six six thousand three hundred on my tent channel but youtube doesn't pay that well anyways what i've gained more is people have told me new products new tips um, relationships that have earned me more money than YouTube could have ever paid me monthly. Right. Now, that's an interesting perspective. So one of the things that I often talk about is that, you know, Instagram, when you're a service-based business, um, you know, like yourself and you need people in your area, 
building this massive following that may or may not be in your area is not necessarily serving the purpose. Often it's a bit of a vanity metric. Yeah, you know, yeah. if you are a cleaning company and you have this great um, massive population um, in across the continent, it, it's not really benefiting your business. So, you know, but these are pieces, building relationships, networking, new products, these types of things. This is a great use for social media that still is providing results, but not necessarily in the most direct conventional way of, you know, sales conversions. Yeah. My, my tank guy YouTube channel has nothing to do with my business. Like I don't have a channel for my business and nor would I want customers seeing some of the things I say. Right. There. Right. So to do it all over again, <laughs> if you were to say, if you were going to start your YouTube channel now, knowing what you know now and everything you've learned, would you make any changes? No, I'm still doing it the way I did it. The only thing I'm doing now differently is I just had a really kind of crappy thumbnail in the beginning. Um, and still my thumbnails are not that great. But uh, my first 50 videos, I just would have done different thumbnails. No, I'm not doing anything different. I, I, I don't like it. <laughs> not that I don't like it. I just, I just don't want to put that much time into it. Um, I just want to turn the camera on and go and do a few edits and upload. If, if I had to spend five hours a day doing this, uh, right. I just wouldn't do it. So what about other parts of your business? Where do you feel your energy and time is best spent when it comes to scaling your business? Um, kind of, this kind of brings us back to something you were saying before about like, you know, the clothing line, you got another line, it's not a different business. Um, so in any business you're in for a little while, you start to see things like, oh, that's related. There's this, oh, people are doing this. Like in the... I'm just going to say the wedding industry for, cause that's what I'm mainly in is we're just there doing tents, tables, chairs, dance floors. But then you see a caterer there who's rented dishes and rented ovens. And so like I got those and then every single job we're at, we see this same goddamn dude showing up with a restroom trailer and he's out in 15 minutes and it's like, all right, we can get a restroom trailer too. And then there's just more pieces to the pie. In any business you're in, I could do DJing if I wanted to. I could do photo booths. Like we could even do catering. I, I think once you have a successful business and you are in it, and you can see all the other things. That's where you go. That's how you grow. Because it's a lot. Like if I just decided to start a dog cleaning business, yeah, no, I don't have any time for that. But but if I add refrigerators into my inventory, I'm already at the job site. I'm already doing it. Now I can more of it yes absolutely absolutely that that going you know deeper instead of wider in the same in the same industry yeah. like uh we got this opportunity to do uh, glamping tents you know the big giant tents got real beds you know it's like a real room inside of a tent it's camping for bougie camping. <laughs> but uh so uh, I, I kind of initially initially thought that this was like complementary to my business it's still renting out a tent it's just a different kind of tent and then sitting down thinking about it, I was like, no, this is way different. This is super high touch kind of stuff. This is dealing with people who have really high expectations. This is a full-time business. Um, and it's, it's, it's not really related to my business, even though it seems like it. And if I did it, I could, I 100% already know we're going to make $200,000 the first year doing it. But Number one, I couldn't find anyone to run it like I found before. I've run out of people. And number two, it's it's a sideways it's a sideways move, even though it seems like it's not. But it, 100% is a different business. Uh, it's not in the same realm. So let me just find something in the same realm that I can do. That is so valuable. That example, and you know, it it is it is still you know the the tent business, um, but it is entirely different, and it. In, in not in all ways, you know, there are certain things that you would be able to 100%, um, you know, would cross over. But if you took that same amount of energy that it would take for that first year of something that is entirely different um, and put it into your same business, you could also create some massive growth. And and recognizing that difference before jumping in, I think, is is key there. There's, there's another thing I want to touch on. Um in any business, but I would say I gotta use myself as the example. Uh, 
you, you start to be like, um, let's offer this, let's offer that. I wanted to offer fancy, fancy chairs. I had these fancy, fancy tents and stuff, and they just weren't going out that much. And they were the kind of things that don't fold in store easily. They're just big bulky items. And people would always balk at the price. And I just started hating them. And every time we had to send them out, they were like a full truckload plus the other truckload of normal stuff. And I just hated it. And then I just started thinking like, you know, I make money on the white chairs, the rustic chairs, basic tables, basic chairs. And this is what I make money on every single weekend, no matter what, this always goes out. Sure, this fancy stuff goes out every three, four weeks and makes, you know, $30,000 that weekend, but it's, it's annoying. So I sold all of that stuff off um, and just focus in on the stuff that, bring, that, does, that goes out every single weekend. So that's the wedding thing. But like in your own, anyone's business, there's always a tendency to be like, I'm going to add this, I'm going to add that because they're the fancy, cool, like awesome things. But they don't always add that much. They, they may make your Instagram page look cooler and your website, but they are not always worth it. And you could have spent that money, you know, on the core stuff instead of five years later being like, oh, I'm going to sell it now and then buy the core stuff. Right. Yes. Consistency is so key when it comes to business and, and creating that predictable, repeatable process. And so as soon as you add in something that just doesn't doesn't fit into the regular flow, um, you know, whether it's additional trucking or, you know, difficulty in setting things up or just just the sales process. It's just that time and energy. I always reflect back on, you know, the fact that Steve Jobs always wore the same sweater because it was just easy. It was easy. You know, you don't have to just he didn't have to decide. He just put it on. And it was one less thing to worry about. And it's really the same thing in your business, because when you have something that just just takes up that extra energy all the time and extra capacity, it's it's really where, you know, what is the opportunity cost of that? What could you be doing with that time and 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 growing right. something that is going to consistently just just make money? You know, if you're saying, well, like, I know that this other stuff can go out. Um, and it can it can generate, and I know exactly what it takes to do it, and and all of these pieces. That as much as it's not as flashy, I feel like sometimes entrepreneurs in general, it's the the new and shiny because we you know, passion driven. Yeah. It's like oh, I can make something happen with that, but just because you can doesn't mean you should. Exactly, I like how you said the opportunity cost um, because we're talking about service based businesses, which is kind of like you have to go. A lot of these service based businesses is you have to go places mm-hmm. and do things. Obviously, there's service-based businesses where people come to you. But for the ones where you have to go places, we used to go anywhere that anyone would be willing to pay the delivery <laughs> fee. But once you start looking at it, it's like, wow, we're four hours to get there, four hours on site, four hours to get back. We could have done so much more in those eight hours of driving, made way more money than the delivery fee that we charge to get there. Uh, so I just stopped going certain distances. I, I cut off this one town entirely because uh, I hate how far it is. It's in the mountains. I got giant trucks and we can't ever get down people's driveways, whatever. But uh, there's an opportunity cost to like taking that. Sure, the job may be 10 grand, but if you would have stayed for those 12 hours at home, you probably would have made 11 grand and not had to go so far or way more than that. Right. You know, I would say. I was speaking earlier. Um, we have a, a mastermind group that has a weekly uh, coffee meeting, and we were talking about just that, and you know the the cost of doing a job and this this balance of when things are quiet, taking on work that might be less profitable just to keep things moving. And and you know there was kind of this discussion about what was the real cost of doing that, and and you know the business. And I think there's an element of what is the risk? You know, it's the risk versus reward. And of course we all, you know, if we have employees um, that we want to keep working, everybody has families to feed and, and whatnot, but there's certain industries where taking on that extra less profitable work comes with a, you know, risk. And so for, for yourself taking these, you know, a truck that you, if you break down all of a sudden way out of town or something like that, there's this potential for additional cost. And so, you know, one of the, the, companies we were discussing with plumbing company and it's okay well you know what if that job that we all know isn't going to make any money what if there's a big water leak and suddenly now you're dealing with massive costs 
you know, it's it's these different pieces of, um, you know, evaluating and, and running a business really is managing resources and risk and, you know, basically right. making the, the, the most efficient use of the resources we have and managing to keep the risk low and and everyone's, you know, level of risk aversion is going to be a little different, but it really comes down to dollars and dollars and cents at the end of the day. Right. Um, I have another thing kind of related. So like we used to do these little tiny jobs, maybe 50 chairs on a Saturday where you have to go drop them off in a park, stay there the whole time because there's no point in coming back and then pick them up and, or other, we did things on decks. We just did difficult things. So for any business who's doing something that you kind of just don't like doing or don't want to do, and you're kind of like, I'm in business, I'll do it. And you charge something for it. But if you find yourself on the job being mad or the drive there being annoyed, uh, you didn't charge enough. Now I charge crazy for those things. If someone wants something that we used to do for 250, like a tent on a deck, I'll just be like, yeah, it costs the cost of the tent plus $2,000 to put it on that <laughs> deck. And if they say, yeah, and we're doing it, I'm no longer mad. I'm like, oh, I've got $2,000 to, to do this. So you got to charge enough so that when you're on the job, you're like, these idiots paid me for this. No, I'm, I'm not mad that I'm here. Yes, it's, it, you know, money doesn't make the world go round, but it does, you know, man, it help help manage resources and manage risk and cover off some of these pieces. And, and you're protecting your own energy. At the end of the day, uh, running a business, your right. time and energy is honestly the most important. Yeah. So in terms of, you know, tangible tips for someone to implement right now, you've got so many different, um, you know, different businesses, years of experience, all these pieces. If you had, um, you know, an entrepreneur saying, what is the, the, the piece of advice you have for me that can make the biggest difference tomorrow? What would that be? Okay. So I'm going to use myself as an example and someone I did an interview. He's a chiropractor. I'll go with myself okay. first. Uh, I'm going to ask you, what business would you say that I am in? What is the end result of my, of putting up a tent? What is the end result of putting up a tent? Yeah. What is what is my business? What's the end result of my party rental business? What happens? Well, gatherings. Yes. Party, right? Get, so I'm in. Everyone would say that I'm in the event business, and that's what I used to think I was in too. That the end result of my business is events, so I'm in the event business. And then I kind of always knew this intuitively, but it took some really experienced guy saying, you're not in the event business. None of us are. Unless you're a wedding planner, a photographer, actually on site, you're not in the event business. You're in the material handling and logistics mm -hmm. business. So, um, so you got to know what business you're actually in. Once I fully realized that, now I can spend, you know, $8,000 on jackhammers and not feel bad about it because it makes the day go faster. It makes the employees less tired. It makes everything go easier. I can put every, you know buy things, put put them on wheels, get trucks with lift gates, because my entire job is getting stuff from the warehouse to the truck, truck to the site, and reverse the whole process. So if I can focus on that, then I just make more profit. I could just buy, you know, a hundred more tents and ten thousand more chairs and stuff, and work five more hours a day, you know, going crazy and not even make any more profit, making more revenue, or I can invest in the material handling and logistics stuff, do the same amount of work, but faster, making more profit without having to, you know, put more into inventory. And then this chiropractor I talked to, everyone would say he's a chiropractor, he fixes people's backs. Well, he doesn't think he's a chiropractor. It's the end of the result of what he does, but he focuses all his time and attention on customer acquisition. Because if you're just sitting there being a chiropractor every day, just waiting for people to call, you got 40 clients a month. He wants 500 clients a month. So he does Instagram, TikTok, he does everything. He does little, he puts out just little information, little free tips, people see him and then they're like, oh, I, I need my back fixed, I'll call. Because it's one of those things like, if you break your foot, you find a doctor. But a lot of people don't think about finding a chiropractor until it's too late or too bad. So he was able to take his 50 clients, turn them to 500 a month because he views himself as a client acquisition company. Um, so he does his chiropractic and then the rest of the time he does that and pays everyone else to run the business. So you have to know what business you're in. And if, you, if you're just thinking that whatever business you're in is the end result of your business, 
you might be wrong because there's a lot of other stuff in there that might actually be your real business. Mm, yes. Very interesting. And I, you know, this concept when you were talking about, you know, revenue versus profit and, and this, you know, oh, do you want to add another $10,000 sales, you know, a month? This seems to be the magical online question. Everybody wants to boost their sales by 10K a month. But at the end of the day, right. boosting the sales by 10K is a significantly different outcome than boosting, uh, you know, and focusing your operations and saving the operation, you know, saving 10K on the operations and creating efficiencies. The end result is just a significantly stronger business, happier people um, and, and whatnot. So I, I love that focus on being more efficient and the logistics of things um, often, often yeah. underestimated is the uh, the ability and the fulfillment side of actually performing the service in a scalable way. Right. One of my friends' business is at $5 million a year. And when I was talking to him, he's like, you know, there's other people in his field making 10 million, 12 million. And he's like, 5 million a year at, in this business is a lot of profit. If you try to go to 10 million, it's way more work, but you don't get any extra profit. Uh, to, where you start seeing more profit is once you get to $20 million, then it's an unbelievable craziness. But for, for all those years in between 5 million and 20 million, it's just more work with no more extra money coming. Well, you know, you're getting more revenue, but no more profit, just way more work. Yes. And, and how common is it just to, just to want to keep growing and, and not necessarily really evaluate that and, and to know and for, you know, for him to, to evaluate that now and say, hey, like, this is the sweet spot. I'm good here. Um, you know, and, and yeah. it all comes down to different times and different phases in the business. There may be a time where he, he says, hey, I really want to go to that 20 million mark. Um, but for now, the decision is a, is a strategic one to stay at the same size because that, uh, you know, what we often refer to as the valley of death between five and 20, that's a pretty big valley. And so to maintain and keep pushing on, there's a lot of risk in there, um, you know, longevity and, and sustainability. So the decision to stay at that, that size that's offering the better return uh, is definitely fits his, his choices there. Yeah, I mean, there's some people who that's the ultimate goal is just to get the company as big as possible. And that's the drive. And there's other people who, you know, got it to the point they wanted to or are happy at the point it's, it's at. And that's fine too. You don't always have to be, you know, you don't have to be the t-shirt company that makes 30 million a year. You could be the t-shirt company that pays yourself 250 a year and be happy mm -hmm. with that. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's, uh, I think that it comes down to knowing, making the decisions based on, um, you know, the, the end objective and using the data and knowing and making those decisions, not not deciding, hey, I just wanna keep growing, but I don't know how much and I don't know what my profit margins are here or then. Um, and you know, this this kind of blind, just, I just wanna keep growing can often get businesses into trouble. Um, but the decision to to stay or to to grow really comes down to knowing the numbers and and using them. And, and often I think, you know, people, especially as they're starting out, don't want to dive into analytics, don't want to talk about, you know, what's working and what's not. But often it just comes down to that. What is what is logical? What is reasonable? And and saying, you know, OK, well, I can do this much work and make this much profit or I can tr double the work and make the same amount of profit. I mean, it just you don't you don't need to have gone to business school to know sometimes that it's it's just the decision is made for you, really. Um, if, if there's enough time, I got. OK, one more let's do it. Okay, so a lot of people, you know, they're going to want to sell their business at one day or they're going to want to sell their business one day, um, but you're not going to be able to if the entire business relies on you. In order to get the most money for your business, someone who's coming in to buy a business doesn't want to buy the job. It's an investment for them. They want to come into an already running operation. If it's a plumbing operation, they want a big team of guys that kind of run themselves. They're not going to mind working in there, you know, anywhere from eight hours a week to maybe even 40, but they don't want to be the entire reason why the business exists. So if you're ever going to sell your business, you need to think how to get to the point to where the business does not need you. Yes, you're still going to work there. You're probably going to do the books. You're going to do some things, but you're not going to be hands on with everything. 
uh, so that one day you can sell it. Because if all of a sudden just today you decide to sell it, no one's going to buy it because they 100% need you in there or they're going to have to come in and take over your role. So if you're ever going to sell your business, you need to get it to the point where it doesn't necessarily need you there every day. Absolutely. A fantastic advice. Yes. Preparing to sell a business often takes long-term planning for things just like that. Um, you know, unless you are wanting to sell yourself and your time with your business, you realistically need to be able to, the business needs to be able to run without you or, you know, yeah. with some training talk, and, and, you know, different standard operating procedures. Yeah, I talked to two, I talked to two business brokers recently for interviews and they both said the same thing, at least three years. You don't just decide you're going to sell your business one day. Um, you decide you're going to sell it three years from now. Right, right. Great, great advice. Well, Adam, if people want to, you know, learn more about you, your business and what you have going on, where can they connect with you? Oh, Lord. Um, hopefully you put all these down down somewhere. Um, we got the Tank Guy YouTube channel, the Tank Guy Instagram. Uh, I got a separate channel interviewing business owners called How I Started. And that one's hard to find on YouTube. I should have had a different name because you type in How I Started and it never comes up. Um, I got a TikTok thing called real world side hustles to talk about like real things instead of like dumb online stuff. Um, and then I got that, that's the business stuff. I got, I also have a Twitch channel where I stream. I just bought an arcade, like a four person arcade and I'm streaming it cause I thought it'd be cool. Um, and I got several other YouTube channels about other things. But so that's another reason why I don't I can't spend too much time editing because I, I think I got 12 YouTube channels. That's that's amazing. I that yes, very cool. Very cool. It it One. it's very interesting the exposure that YouTube can offer and the people you can connect with. Right. My craziest YouTube channel, if anyone wants to watch, is called Coin Pushing Craziness. I bought a coin pusher and I pretend like I'm playing somewhere and try to win stuff. <laughs> Very cool. And pe people watch Well, it. thank you so much, Adam. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you for having me Thank out. you. Well, we are all out of time for today. If you guys have not joined the Service-Based Business Society Facebook community, make sure you head on over to Facebook and we can continue the conversation. Be sure to also follow the show by going to any podcast app and searching Service-Based Business Society, click subscribe, click the fifth star, and leave us a written review. Have a great week and we will see you soon.